So my name is Tyler Everett. I'm a citizen of the Aroostook Band of Micmacs, and I'm a forester here at Passamaquoddy Forestry Department. My Micmac heritage comes from my mother's side of the family. My great-grandmother was Mary Rose Pictou, and my great-grandfather was Albert Labrador, uh, both of which uh, made baskets. I started making potato baskets, and then that was in the county, and they moved to southern Maine, where I grew up, selling fancy baskets in the Portland area. Today we're on Passamaquoddy Forest land, um, so I'm a forester with the Passamaquoddy Forestry Department. I primarily work in the summer months, uh, and then during the academic year, I'm at the University of Maine as a PhD student. I study under Professor John Daigle, who's a citizen of the Penobscot Nation. Um, we've been doing a lot of research and work around brown ash. My work here at Passamaquoddy has a lot to do with brown ash too. Uh, we've been doing an inventory project for the last two years, uh, trying to identify um, brown ash stands on tribal land, primarily in the western portion of the ownership. The other half of the week I'm with uh, United South and Eastern Tribes. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that works with 33 federally recognized tribes from Maine all the way down to Florida, across the Gulf Coast into Texas. Um, I'm the forest adaptation technical assistant uh, at, at USET. My supervisor, Dr. Casey Thornbrew, is the Northeast and Southeast Tribal Climate Science Liaison. We work with the Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Centers uh, to provide technical um, services to our membership um, on all things climate science related. There is some overlap between USET and my work with, with Brown Ash and here at Passamaquoddy, this inventory work, some of the work that I do to share what we've kind of been working on here at Passamaquoddy with the rest of the tribal nations in Maine. Um, a lot of times has USET as a partner and so I can uh, sometimes be shifting from uh, one hat to the other in the same instant. So I've always liked the outdoors, uh, just about all my hobbies, uh, from fishing, hiking, hunting, cross-country skiing, uh, require that you be outdoors. Um, and I think what sets up the landscape are the trees. Um, but I didn't actually intend on being a forester when I went to school. I was originally an environmental engineer and uh, I started um, that academic path and it just didn't fit. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I took um, a, a forest vegetation class um, as part of one of my minors, which was a forestry minor. And I, I started to learn more about the, the forest trees uh, that, that we have here in Maine. And I you know, took an interest. A lot of my friends were foresters and were studying forestry. Um, so I had a bit of a community that you know, kind of helped progress that uh, passion and then I got an internship working with the Passamaquoddy Forestry Department uh, through the BIA Pathways Program. Um, that internship uh, brought me here to Western Maine working on Passamaquoddy Forest Land. Uh, my supervisor at the time was Ernie Neptune. Uh, he had encouraged me um, both in my undergrad and in my master's program to do some research that was related to the work that I was doing here at Passamaquoddy. And so that could have been the sugar bush. So we have a, a large sugar bush operation here in Western Maine, but with the pressing issue of emerald ash borer and then my connection to basketry through my family, I thought that it would be um, a great project to, to focus in on brown ash. Um, and so now I've been working the last uh, five years surrounding brown ash and trying to come up with adaptive management strategies for emerald ash borer. Uh, brown ash is culturally significant. I already mentioned earlier that uh, my family's got a connection to basketry, but across all of the Wabanuaki tribal nations, um, there's connections to basketry. Basket makers and harvesters in all of those communities um, rely on the resource to sustain their culture. It's a big part of their cultural identity. Um, it's also an economic input to, to a lot of their lives. And then beyond that, the cultural significance has a lot to do with the creation story for the Wabanoaki. The creator created a very common legend within 
Wabanoaki stories, which is Gluskab or Gluskabe. He fires his bow and arrow at the brown ash trees. Uh, when the arrow hits the brown ash tree, it splits open, just like the splints that we use in baskets. And then all the Wabanoaki people emerged. Um, so beyond just the basketry and the sense of community and culture that's around that uh, traditional art, there's also this creation story. So deeply tied to our, our cultural identities. Emerald ash borer is the threat that's, that's um, pending here in Maine. It's arrived in Maine. The tribal community, both um, basket makers and harvesters, but also just the general tribal community that know that brown ash is culturally significant and important to basket makers and harvesters, uh, are worried because emerald ash borer has devastated ash across North America uh, since its arrival in the early 2000s. Uh, and it hasn't really been slowed down. Uh, it's increased and in spread due to transport of firewood and uh, forest practices that you know were initially tried and, and maybe even encouraged and have not had positive impacts on the forest. So now what we're trying to do is come up with some adaptive management strategies that would work on tribal land to one, make our brown ash stands more resilient to emerald ash borer, uh, and two, in the long run, we'd like to sustain brown ash on the landscape uh, for future generations to harvest for the use in cultural practices like basketry and inform the public and the, the tribal community about the work that we're doing. So in the research project that we're working on, the idea is to first come up with an adaptive management strategy that the tribal communities in Maine would agree to or, and would like to see employed on tribal land. And so we're going to hold uh, community meetings, um, invite basket makers, harvesters, uh, and tribal natural resource staff, forestry staff, as well as you know anyone in the general tribal community that would be interested in, in learning and voicing their opinion. Uh, and then we'd share what those adaptive management strategies could be. So you know, seed collection is a, is a really common thread for a strategy long term. You know, we can store those seeds uh, and seed banking facilities and use those for repatriation efforts after emerald ash borer comes through and, and devastates a forest. We can also get some seedling stock from the seeds that we collect uh, and underplant in some of these brown ash stands. The other strategy that's commonly talked about is uh, insecticide treatments. So there's some insecticides that have, seen, have been seen to be really effective uh, in keeping emerald ash borer populations low enough uh, to sustain ash, but the, the chemical itself uh, isn't the most environmentally friendly. There's a lot of contentious opinions surrounding it. And so bringing it to the tribal community as a possible option is important to see, you know, what are their concerns um, and, and how does that influence how the forestry department might go forward with either not or, or using insecticides. Then there's these biological controls, which are these non-native uh, parasitoid wasps that are from Southeast Asia, where emerald ash borer is native to. And so they're natural enemies to emerald ash borer, uh, natural enemies that we don't have here in Maine. And so if we introduce these non-native parasitoid wasps, the idea is that it would control emerald ash borer populations to a point where we can sustain the interaction between brown ash and emerald ash borer. Um, they're, they're establishing in a lot of areas and they're being released even in Maine and sharing, you know, the current status of biological controls, the pros and cons, you know, what are the risks that you're taking by releasing them uh, with the tribal community is another thing we want to do. And then there's silviculture, right? We can come in and harvest trees that we know would pull emerald ash borer in, trees that are low vigor, um, susceptible to emerald ash borer they would be releasing these stress-induced volatiles that would call emerald ash borer to the stand. Um, and so by removing those and still maintaining enough forest cover um, to keep the hydrology at sound, um, but also release maybe some of these understory brown ash that you can even see here at the site, uh, you can have the next cohort of brown ash trees at a site um, and have a site that's a little bit more resilient to emerald ash borer. Um, and you know, as I spit all those out, what I kind of painted is an integrated pest management strategy. So a, a variety of different tactics 
that could be employed um, at different points in time um, as emerald ash borer arrives or, or, or nears a tribal ash stand. Um, and that's what we want to develop is an integrated pest management strategy. That would be the product that we would give to tribal forest managers, natural resource staff, uh, and if we're consulting the, the tribal community and basket makers before we do that, we, we know that the integrated pest management strategy that we were developing would be you know, something that tribal members would be happy to see employed on, on tribal forest land. That's the end goal. Back to what I had said at the beginning um, and why I got into forestry, a lot of my hobbies were in the outdoors. I don't think that that's, that's changed. I think a lot of, um, I know that you know, my two niece, I think about them and they, they go out into the woods. They like to hike, um, kayak. And so when you're in the outdoors and you, know, you start to respect what you're enjoying and what you're able to take advantage of, you know, I think with climate change, um, impacts to deforestation, all these environmental concerns that are more prevalent now in the news, uh, I think that it's something young people can certainly rally behind. And I think that that is the case. Um, I think a great field that people don't think about in terms of protecting um, our forests and natural resources is forestry. Um, more and more foresters are taking the time to consider some of these environmental impacts and how managing forests can fit into that narrative. So that's where I would encourage people to get into a career in forestry. It's, um, it can be a really rewarding profession if you, know, you take the time to, to manage in the way that you would see your values fit. So. Anything else you want to say? Oh, I think that's it.